The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I'm going to give a kind of a, a, a part two because I believe God is really on this theme of experience. We need to experience deeper in a, in a just experience Jesus in a much deeper, deeper way in the days ahead. And so I guess out of all the ministry styles, I guess John was always my favorite because his emphasis, everything from the Gospel of John, the Epistle, uh, to the Book of Revelation, everything was internal realities. He wasn't so big on theory or church structure or even evangelism. His, his basically, his emphasis was that you could see the calling in his life. Uh, when Jesus found him, remember what John was doing? Mending nets. Mending the nets. Looking for the weak areas and strengthening the weak areas. Knowing that there's a harvest coming and we need to be come together in a unity that can hold the harvest. There needs to be a strength. Now we know Peter was the fisherman, right? He was fishing. I'll make you a fisher of men. And everything you read about Peter was the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Everybody can get saved. He wasn't big on structure. That was Paul. He was the wise master builder. All Peter did was the kingdom of God. Everybody can say, oh, the Gentiles can get saved. Oh, everybody can get saved. Everything is good. Paul was a tent maker, wise master builder. And probably the one that I believe that God's saying is a preliminary is James. James, the Lord's brother, growing up under the shadow of his brother. Jesus, can you imagine what that felt like? Hmm? Wow. And then James, no miracles, no testimonies of any of the great things he did. He was in obscurity and remained in obscurity. But for us, it's a picture of our primary ministry to offer our body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, to die to any reputation of being seen or heard. That's all of us need that. We all need the James. And I know, I know Nelsie here is basically more like Peter. We're all, you're all going to get saved. <laughs> saved and healed up and moved on. Whether you want to or not, you shall. <laughs> but John, it was the family of God. It was the inward realities. And I want you to uh, just give kind of an introduction of where I believe we're going with this. Uh, we started to cover some of the seven realities uh, uh, last week. Um, but Paul's writings were compiled around 67 A.D., uh, Around 90 A.D., uh, his writings came forth. Uh, John's ministry was to mend the broken nets and also consummate the entire divine revelation of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, both the Gospels and the Epistles. John's focus in, is the mysteries, the mysteries of the divine life. Uh, those of you, when you read John's Gospel, it unveils the person and the work of Jesus himself, all right? We emphasize grace and truth, grace and truth. In the epistles, John is concerned with the believers experiencing, and this is my passion. I don't want you to just read the Bible. I want you to experience it till you become a partaker of the divine nature. And that was his emphasis in the epistles. And finally, Revelation reveals the mystery of the Messiah who basically, even in the messages to the churches, here's your strengths, here's your weaknesses, let's come together. Let's mend the net so that you're whole and complete and, and giving the, the uh, entering into the purpose of God that He has for you corporately. But in 1 John, there's at least seven keys or mysteries for the expression of God that God desires to be expressed through His children. And so some of this will be a repeat from the last message. I spent a lot of time on the terms 
last week. So um, <clears throat> I want to cover the first mystery, and I always felt this was important, was that I felt the church has emphasized certain scriptures like, I only do what I see my father doing, and I only say what I hear my father saying. Of course, that's the wrong here. But, <laughs> but for me, from the time I was a baby Christian, I'm going, how come, for me, the presence of God is a constant? How come they don't talk about the internal reality of touch? When it's so clear in Scripture that when Jesus said, I only say what I hear, I only uh, speak what I see my Father doing, that that can't happen unless you're in constant communion. You have to be in a touching, constant relationship with Him for those kinds of things to be flowing out of you. And so I'm saying, I see it in 1 John though. They're talking about Jesus' earth walk and touching Him. They said, our eyes saw Him in person, in the flesh. Our hands touched Him. Our eyes saw Him. Our ears heard Him. All right. Then the second element of touch is found that after the resurrection, remember Thomas, doubting Thomas, I won't believe unless I put my fingers into the wounds. And he appeared, Thomas, come on over here. And he let him put his hands in the wounds. Notice there was no blood. He, had, he said, but I'm not a spirit, flesh and flesh and bone, right here, but no blood. Why? What's Leviticus say? Life is in the blood. What life? Your carnal, your carnal life. That's why there was always a blood sacrifice for the remission of sin, whether it was in the old ceremony, but now through the blood of Jesus, He was totally poured out. His blood was given. His flesh life was given for us. They t but Thomas touched that body. And now in, in the epistle of 1 John, John's saying, I'm still touching him. I want you to fellowship with us. I'm fellowshipping with him. I see him, I hear him, and I touch him. Isn't that what he's saying? And I'm so excited about this because this is available for you too. You can see and hear and touch him. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and with Jesus, just like I saw in that baptism that I experienced where the, the power of the Holy Spirit was so strong but Jesus was filling me from head to toe, but we, my hands went up and I was worshiping the Father, Jesus Himself, taking me to that realm of the Trinity to where all three were one. That touching I love that scripture in Acts 17 where it says, so that we should seek God in hope that we might feel after Him and find Him, although He's not far from any of us. So if He's not far from any of us and, and you're God indwelt, then if you're seeking to teach Him, touch Him, where do you go? You go to heaven? No, you go to Jesus within. And as you learn to go to Jesus within, you learn to commune. As you learn to commune, you move into the second mystery. The first mystery is that you're God indwelt. That was the mystery you're saying. We're still fellowshipping with Him. The difference is it's not just Him in heaven, it's Him inside. It is Messiah within the hope of glory. Jesus within the hope of glory. Now, if that's the first revelation, that I am now God indwelt. Remember, Old Testament people were not God indwelt. This is a new experience, the new creation. The second reality or mystery. You know what a mystery is? That's something that's to be revealed. It's not to be hidden. It can be hidden from the unsaved, but it was meant to be revealed to us who believe, right? So God reveals the second mystery. The second mystery is basically not only can we touch Him, not only have we found that mystery of Jesus inside of me and becoming God inside minded, but I am now entering into the next mystery. In 1 John 1, verses 3 through 7, it says, That which we've seen, we've heard, and we declare. That which we have seen, heard, and declare. That which you, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our 
fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. This is the second mystery. The second mystery is not only does, does He live in us, but we fellowship. In other words, fellowship is not some kind of mental function. It's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit reality. It's a flow of life. And that's a good place to plug our book. Didn't I plug it last week? I want to plug it again. The book that's coming out March of 2018 is basically how <clears throat> the, uh, the will of God flows like a river. Amen. Flowing in the will of God like a river. Or flowing in the river. Whatever they decide is the title, that will be the title. But it's meant to be a flow of life. So fellowship is meant to be an experience that you just don't have in church. You have it anywhere you're at. Moment by moment. In the marketplace. It's joint participation. I, I, this is important when I say joint participation. The reason this is so important is we found for people to learn to repent and forgive, and, and it went viral throughout the church. People were just saying, I tried to forgive for years and never made a lot of progress with it. And suddenly, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what Dennis and Jennifer said, and it's working. Here's what Dennis and Jennifer said, and here's why it worked. We would say, people were trying to forgive from their head. And what, what, when you forgive from your head, sincerely or not, that's the you. What you is that? That's the flesh you. You, the flesh you, can't do anything. So you struggle. That's independent of Jesus. You can't live the Christian life, that you. But there's another you. And that you is, this, your spirit was mingled with his spirit as a new creation, and that's the real you. So when you do it from the heart, you, from the heart, it's a totally different you, isn't it? When I release forgiveness from the heart, that's the new creation me. That's where I was joined in the Spirit. They that are joined to the Spirit are one Spirit with Him. So now it's commingling that Spirit that flows out of your belly like rivers of living water. It's living water. There's no living water. Third graders used to tell us when we taught the children, there's no living water in your head. Everybody knows that. And I'm going, oh, I got some adults that don't know that. <laughs> but they knew there's no living water in your head. Out of my belly flows river. So when I say you need to forgive, can you translate that properly now? You need to forgive. It, the whole body of Christ suffered in the concept of simple biblical forgiveness, which Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart. And that went viral throughout the body of Christ. We to, our, our books have to continually reiterate that because by and large, most Christians are sincere, but they are sincerely wrong, forgiving from their head, and they're sincere. And what happens to a sincere Christian that does it wrong? They get upset, don't they? <laughs> they want to quit. They want to give up. When all you have to do is get them from here to here, where the you changes. As a matter of fact, in order to facilitate that forgiveness to see rapid results and change lives, we had to teach them, let Jesus, the forgiver, forgive through you. Because then the you is automatic. It's automatically your spiritual you. Let G Who can, only Jesus can forgive sin, correct? So if he's not involved in the forgiving, it's not going to happen. Unsaved people do not really know how to forgive. They cope. They change subjects. That's a rational tool. But unless you forgive from the heart. Literally, our ministry to Christians who've been seasoned Christians for years radically changed them in a short period of time. And when you get down to the nitty gritty, all we taught them was the simplicity of unless you forgive from the heart. And they had to write books on it. You think we have a ways to go? Because I want to get you to the next and the next level after that, that is experience. You need experience. You don't need more Bible teaching. You need more experience of the Bible you already know. That's right. right? Just think. 
You believed all along that the Bible said you were supposed to forgive and then you struggled with it. Forgiveness is instant. They've even developed bad theology saying it's a difficult, long process. Only because the person had a difficult and a long time doing it. There was a time when people would have argued that you can't just get saved just like that. They would have said, no, it's a long, difficult process. And you have to work at it for a long time. And then, I hope that I'm saved. I dealt with some Amish people and I kept telling them, well, I'm just so glad that I know that I have Jesus in me and that I am saved. And he goes, well, I hope so. <laughs> we lived in a very strong Amish. Uh, they knew their Bible, but their, their theology was, I uh, hope so. They kept hoping so. And I kept saying, no, we know so. Right? All right. So this, this mystery of this fellowship, this joint participation, flowing in the river of God's will, flowing in the river of God's will, it was meant to be a constant. And how can I live as a constant? You know what? You'd be shocked to know that if you feel nothing down here, Jesus is Lord of your life right then. Nothing. Well, what do you mean, nothing? I don't feel nothing. Well, with God, nothing is impossible. He's in you. You are God and dwell. We've got to go back to mystery number one. You're God and dwell. Now I'm playing with that scripture, all right. But nothing is impossible. If you're God and dwell, he didn't go anywhere. He's in you. Christ in you, this is the mystery, the hope of glory. And then we have people that go, well, well, you know, what's there to think about? He's in there. He didn't go nowhere. When you feel nothing, Jesus is Lord. That's a feeling, believe it or not, because just like your salvation, right? I know that I know. This knower. This knower knows. You didn't, how many know you're saved? You know you're saved? That's a feeling. That's not mental assent. Mental assent always wonders. Well, I hope so. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm getting there. Do you know that there's even a test for this? There's even a how-to? Jennifer, come on up here. Let me show them the how-to. We did this when we traveled. It needs to be seen on Ustream because you people need to realize this. Do you ever have people struggled with their salvation? Yeah, here's a simple cure. This is where you got saved, not here. You, got, you ask Jesus into your Bible heart. This is the door. It goes, uh, it's like invisible arms That's reach out and receive. Says, where the Bible says your heart That's is. where your Bible says your I don't care what you say or Hallmark says your heart is. <laughs> this is where the Bible says, the belly, the gut, the innermost being, the hidden man of the heart, the inward parts. Now, here's what we would do with an unsaved person or struggle, a person who struggled. I'd say, close your eyes. All right, I'm going to whisper a scripture in your ear, and all you have to do is tell me if it feels good or bad. How, is this rocket science or what? Good or bad? Does it feel good or bad? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. Good. Well, you're saved then. That was the assurance. Faith is the substance or the assurance. Assurance is a feeling, duh. <laughs> We're so afraid of that word because we misuse it. <laughs> We're used to carnal emotions. No, no. Assurance is the title deed. In other words, you know in your knower you own it. That's mine. I have an assurance. Now, we prayed with a guy that had been in church for 30 years, came to one of our modules, module one, I think. <coughs> Struggled with everything he read. That's a telltale sign. I know the material. I've read everything you guys wrote. And I said, oh, I, don't get, I don't get it. If you're watching and you're saying, I read that material and I don't get it either, try this. Good or bad, behold what manner of love the Father. If it feels bad, guess what? You need Jesus. You need to get saved. You need saved. You maybe grew up in the church and you gave mental assent. And, um, you know, standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. 
So I'm not impressed that you went to church for 30 years. I'm more impressed that did you have a legitimate experience with Jesus? And if you did, you have your own no-so here. It's not about this. Mental assent will always be the enemy to the true rich experience that there is in Jesus. This guy, we prayed for him and he said, well, I could discern it, but I didn't want to say what I discerned. I felt that when I said, behold what manner of love, it went, dee, dee. and he went, not so good. Doesn't feel so good. And I said, let's ask Jesus to come into your heart. The men went in the restroom, and after I prayed for him, he went in the restroom, and the men said, he's standing in the mirror. <laughs> he, he was total totally countenance Whoa. change. 30 years in the church, <coughs> and total countenance change. He did, I, uh, this is, that, careful now, that might be a feeling. <laughs> you might feel the joy of the Lord there. Amen. Thank you. All right. So that's just two realities. Wouldn't it be fun to just share that with someone else and give them those two realities? That you are God indwelt? Because you'd be surprised a large portion of the church that I would say, <laughs> we did this in churches of a thousand people, right? And the vast majority, 98%, did it wrong. This was our test. This is when we knew we had to teach this, even though it was so simple. We would say, Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Quick, real now. Point to Jesus. 98% of the church pointed to heaven. Did you hear what I said? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where should have been the focus? Even after saying that, they heard hope of glory someday up there. I'll tell you what, you're missing it big time. If 98% of the church does that, don't tell me that they're biblically literate and they know everything. Your experience is sorely lacking. If That's, a, that's like a... Forgive the expression, but that's like a Freudian slip. <laughs> and Freud was evil. <laughs> but really, you, you just gave it away. That your relationship is too distant. If you're pointing to heaven when someone says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, where's Jesus? That's distance is a deception. You are God indwelt. Mystery number one is that you touch him spirit to spirit. You that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. When you feel nothing in the gut, Jesus is ruling. Let the peace of God rule. Peace is the love of God resting. Peace is the love of God working. He's both resting and working. It is God who is at work in you. Look at Philippians 2.13. It is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. Well, where is He willing and performing? In heaven going, oh, there's Dennis, oh my goodness. He's blowing it big time today. No, he's right here. And if I'm blowing it big time, he goes, yeah, you feel it. <laughs> right? You ever said something and then, Argh. he didn't come down from heaven and tell me, Dennis, you blew it big time. I knew it right here. He get put a conscience in there. That's the voice of my spirit. It's in here. And your conscience is in here. Your conscience is here. So, Revelation number two, by that wonderful apostle John who just loved internal realities, was that basically it was meant to be joint participation in a flow. So if I was going to forgive from the heart, all I basic, what's the joint participation in flow? Out of my belly flows. My belly, my new creation personhood. I, I told you, I was a baby Christian and sat with pastors at Assemblies of God and a faith camp pastor, and they were arguing over the word you. And they were both right, and they were arguing. The Assemblies emphasized, just him anyway, not necessarily the Assemblies of God, but just him and say, you can't heal anybody. No, you can't in your flesh. The other guy was faith camp. He basically said, you, your recreated human spirit, new creation, you can certainly release healing to people. You can't heal anybody. Yes, you can. You can't heal anybody. You, they're arguing over the word you. And I'm saying the whole church is still confused over you. Your flesh, the name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. 
That's the wrong you. <laughs> we need to enter into that replaced life to where it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, and I'm fused together with Him. And if I do give in to sin, it's because I've been pulled out of that union. Not because I'm bad inside. It's because the lust and the desires in me drew me out. The world, the flesh, the devil drew me out of that union to operate. It wants you to operate in the old you. Yes. It wants you to operate independently of God. The replaced life is I am not going to operate independently. If I do, I receive forgiveness and get back where I belong. Look at each person. Here's what it would look like in the spirit realm if we could see it. Each person is drawn away. Donuts. Krispy Kreme. I have appetites and desires in here that rise up when I hear donuts. If I yield to it, it pulls me out to operate independently of Jesus and self-control and moderation. Doesn't mean I can't have a donut. It means don't eat two dozen at once. <laughs> then you know something else is, you're out of control. If you're out of Jesus, you're out of control. Peace means he's controlling. I don't want to operate out of that. Revelation number two is joint participation in the flow. If we would get we conscious instead of me conscious. Me is an indication of separation. We is, of course, now go and tell a psychologist or psychiatrist <laughs> that we are doing something. Me and Jesus are doing something. Use the we in front of them and they'll think, you've got problems. Because I hear voices. <laughs> but it's my sheep hear my voice. So anyway, we won't, we won't go there. All right. Revelation number one is what? Jesus in me? Revelation number two, it's joint participation in flow. This is what the epistle of 1 John deals with. Now, this, all of these segue into another, if you read 1 John, all of these segue into another mystery. So the first mystery is that we are God indwelt. The second mystery is that there's fellowship, there's a flow of life, of union and communion that needs to be experientially real, not theoretical. That segues instantly into the third mystery of the anointing of God. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to tell you something. This is fascinating. Did you know in the Old Testament they put a mixture together? How many have read that? Come on, show me a hand. I want to see how many mature people have. There's a mixture. Myrrh, cinnamon, cassia, huh? And anointing oil. Okay, there's a mixture. If you were to just oversimplify it, the first four elements have to do with, you know, myrrh was for burial, death, burial, and resurrection. And the oil was the spirit. So it, the anointing that abides in you is the mixture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and being exalted by the spirit. That anointing is in you. That was just a type and a shadow of what was to come. But you have an anointing and it abides within you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. doesn't mean you don't need teachers. It means the Holy Spirit in you is trying to teach you things that no man can teach you. Unless that man's doing what I'm trying to do and that's to get you to that teacher in you. That anointing wants to reveal things to you. He wants to be your teacher. He wants to show you things that you can know no other way. And that beautiful anointing is in you. They had the mixture. They had the fragrance of the cinnamon, the myrrh, and the uh, cassia. And, the, and I've t smelled oil that was mixed in that. And it's got a pleasant smell to it. But it's only a type and a shadow of what you have in you. That sweetness is in you. And... Death, burial, and the sweetness of that resurrection life, and that victory over death, and then mixing it with the Holy Spirit. That was, that was a perfect picture of what Jesus would do for us, didn't it? Isn't that what Jesus did? He came and gave His humanity, death, burial, resurrection, 
to be lifted by the Spirit. So it was His humanity and His divinity that He came as the second Adam to produce that for us. And that anointing is in you. Wow! That's what you've got inside of you. Now, my mentor was Watchman Nee when I was a baby Christian because he spoke my language, internal realities. And it was funny because he says, most Christians, the problem is not getting Jesus in, it's getting Jesus out. A release of that anointing. Because you can invite him in, have a genuine salvation experience, and live a confined, restricted life. Because your soulish nature wants to be the boss. And you only want to let Jesus out when it's convenient for you. Other than that, you want to be in control. I, I was so fascinated as a baby Christian because I said it's the release of the Spirit that you have to break that outer shell. And I was a hyperactive child and a hyperactive Christian. And when God told me the first step in the release of the anointing is to sh sit down and shut up. I didn't care for that. He said, you don't have anything to say until you've heard something. I didn't care for that either. Because... <laughs> Anything that came out of the scriptures I preached. Oh, there is a ri river. There's a river that makes glad the city of God. And I would feel the anointing go away. And I'm thinking, what am I doing wrong? I'm preaching to God. He goes, no, he, you interrupted him. You don't, you don't have anything to say until you heard something. See, the church is good at talking, prophesying, decree, declare. But until you've heard something... A lot of times you're just off on an, on an adrenaline rush. And in reality, every, oh, I'm going to touch a sacred cow now, but I shouldn't have said that. They might not have known. <laughs> but, you know, everybody wants to be a revivalist. I'll tell you what, if you get excited in my services, I'd be surprised. Because the excitement is going to point to an internal reality of Jesus, not an adrenaline rush that's going to drain out and then you got to get in another revivalist to pump it back up again and then let it drain out. That's never changed. That's never changed society. We need reformers more than we need revivalists. Revivalists is good for the church. Put a little sh shot of unction in there. But in itself, it's not the end. It's not the end. Maturity is the end. Grow up. Stand on your own two feet. Do the work of the ministry. Release the potential in the believers and quit looking at the leaders as a total source of grace. We are not the total source of grace. We're supposed to be coaches and you're the team playing the game. You're to be out there doing like Nelsie's doing. Right where you're at, you don't need a special ministry. God has significantly placed you in a jurisdiction. I used to have people tell me, oh, Pastor, I wish I could just work with all Christians. I'm going, boy, boy you, need, you need counseling. <laughs> maybe, maybe you want to work with all Christians because you want to practice in a less hostile environment than the real world. Less hostile. Matter of fact, that is a good place to practice forgiveness and everything else. Practice it in the church. If you can't do it in the church, you will not survive out there. What I like about Nelsie is she's from my neck of the woods. Well, I was in a better neck of the woods. I was South Chicago, and she was on the north side. But I, I, we get along. I look at Nelsie, and I, I just remember those, those girl gangs. We, oh, gee, the Taylor Capris from Taylor Street. And the... Guys from Taylor Street couldn't dare date a girl from Michigan Avenue because they'd be in big trouble. You only stayed on your own street. And then I moved to a small town, and I'm thinking, wow, what if they did that? There's six houses on White Street. What if only the people on White Street dated people on White Street? We'd be in a real world of hurt, wouldn't we? <laughs> but Nel Nelsie... I'm telling you, you can take these realities and these realities work to help people. And if you would just do or the most promising of our disciples have ever done is they said, look, I don't have it all together, but such as I have, I give to you. And just start. Did you know that what you know with first feel forgive? First feel forgive. You could minister to 80% of the church, including leaders. First feel forgive. 
Right, Jennifer? I ministered to Jennifer. She said, teach me this. I taught her. And she says, that's one, two, three. Matter of fact, our website, forgive. One, two, three. It's that easy. First person or situation, feel the feeling. Forgive out of the real you. Let the forgiver in you release it. How do I know if I did it right? Subjectively. Changes to peace. You forgive or repent and it doesn't change to peace. What does peace indicate in the Bible? The rule of God. Let the peace of God rule. If you don't have peace, you didn't do it right no matter how sincere you were. You were trying. You cannot try and trust at the same time. <laughs> That's a physiological impossibility. And Jennifer says, this works so well, I'm going to do the science behind it and find out the physiology, how it matches the scriptures. And it does. When you're at peace, you accomplish more with less effort. When you're at peace, Jesus is Lord. When you're at peace, you're, she found physiologically, you're, you are operating at optimum IQ. When you are anxious, you drop 20 IQ points. So the Bible's pretty smart when it says, be anxious for nothing but in, Amen. right? Be anxious. It's a contrast. Prayer. Prayer, it doesn't mean I can't be anxious, so I got to go, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. That's not prayer. That's worry and anxiety being expressed. Prayer is being with someone, and even without words, you're touching him spirit to spirit. The opposite of anxiety, then, would be to have the no-so of peace inside in your innermost being. When peace is ruling, I'm with him. To pray constantly is not a complicated thing. It's just that your attitude of prayer is probably talking. No, prayer is being with someone. I'll tell you what, when Jennifer and I would travel, we'd, we'd drive all the way up to New England, and sometimes we wouldn't talk for a half hour, hour at a time. But we enjoyed being with each other. There was an awareness that we were there, I wasn't alone. You should have that awareness with being God indwelt, that you're never alone. There's, that awareness never goes away. You can leave that awareness, but He never leaves or forsakes you. Amen. And that's not from heaven. That's from here. He never leaves or forsakes you. You have to depart from that internal reality. I better move along here. We're not going to cover all these seven realities. How far did we get? Three realities. <laughs> All right. Segways into the next reality. From that anointing that abides within you. And remember, the teaching by the anointing is to your inner spirit. He's teaching you something in here so that it's written on the tablet of the heart. It's an engrafted word. It's being a partaker of the divine nature. You own it. Something is actually being written, which brings us into the next inner reality. The next inner reality, and I love this one, is the mystery of abiding. And actually, you know, people saw us as counselors. They saw us as inner healers. They, they label us based on their own experience. But in reality, you know what? We, we're basically restoring. All of our books are restoring. The lost art of abiding. John 15. That's really what it is. If you abide in me and my word abides in you. In other words, if you stay there, if you dwell, if you practice my presence, as a constant, not when you're in trouble, call out to God. Not a foxhole salvation. All the military men nodded their head. They all know about the, the foxhole. The ones that turn to God one, it's like there's no place else to turn. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, this mystery of, of, of abiding, and this is my favorite part, but that anointing which you have received abides in you. It dwells in you. And it's basically that same anointing will teach you all things. If you would be accustomed to saying, God, show me. I could discern from the minute I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I could discern the human spirit very easily and what was flavoring. And the, the Holy Spirit and demonic spirits. And at first I didn't even want to. I didn't like knowing there was duplicity amongst Christians when they're smiling at you and I could feel bitterness coming from them. I didn't want to know that. But the way I had to let the Holy Spirit teach me, I would walk into a bank, just normal living, 
out and about, walked into the bank and felt the presence of God increase. I would have to then say, what's that? This is how I learned. This is how he wants to teach you if you let him. What is that? And my first thought was an angel. Uh, second thought was somebody's praying for me. Uh, there's another Christian in the room. I looked around. There was only five people counting me in the bank. And I said, Lord, what is that that I'm sensing? And I looked out, and I could see out the front door, and there was a car pulled up with the Holy Spirit on the front license plate. There's another Christian in here. And then I said, this is that. When I, in the presence of a Christian, I can bear witness to it without them telling me they're a Christian. I taught this to Jennifer, right? And we were driving up to New England. We stopped at a pancake house. Waitress came over to take our order, and I felt Jennifer like a little flutter. I missed it. A little flutter, and I went, and then I felt, I could feel that waitress is a Christian. I could feel the spirit. But I wasn't going to say nothing. She's the disciple. So she goes away. I say nothing. She comes back, and I felt Jennifer again get a little, little life, a little butterfly life. <laughs> and she left, and Jennifer goes, she's a Christian, isn't she? And I said, well, the way I had to learn, you need verification now. When she comes back, you ask her. And she came back, she said, are you a Christian? And she goes, I most certainly am, and I'm proud to say that I'm a, I'm a believer. And, Jenna, and I said, well, you can be even more proud that we could discern it without you telling us. That's being an expression. God wants expressions. He don't want lip service all the time. He wants an expression. With some, because you can fool people with your words and you can fool them with your body language, but you can't hide what emanates. When we started this service, what did we notice? Nobody was talking and the anointing increased because you are a fragrance of life. You can't stop from what you emanate. By the way, those that deal with rejection... This is just a free part. There's people that if they have rejection issues, whether they know it or not, there's like an invisible shell around them. And they walk around and they think you're the problem. That's right. They have a wall and that wall comes up to you and you go, and you feel like I can't talk to that person because they have the wall. It isn't all these other people. Then you get, how do you get rid of that wall? I receive forgiveness for taking in all that rejection. Quit being a victim. You are a victor in Christ. And if you want to quit, sure, you learn to forgive other people. But most people have really had a lot of rejection issues. I had to teach them how to forgive, but they were still getting beat up all the time. So I says, yeah, you know how to forgive, but here's what I want you to do. The next time that you even feel someone pressing rejection on you, you blast them with love. Stop being a victim and be a victor. I release out of my belly, I'm blasting love to that person that's trying to set me straight and they don't know what they're talking about. But God bless their heart, I just release love to them. You will stop being a victim. You'll stop sucking in all that hurts and wounds. You walk around like a porcupine and Hurt people hurt people. So everybody you bump into, oh, why does everybody treat me like that? that? That's the problem, me. Your me is all by yourself there. There's no Jesus in that me because it's a we. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. They're a new creation, something that never existed before. All right. Oh, my goodness. I got to cover these other ones fast. But you're going to get them. So... Inner reality, revelation, mystery number four is the mystery of abiding in the Lord. And here's the best part before I move on. Not only is this needs to be maintained or abide, but here's the part that I love the most. I learned as a baby Christian, and I can corroborate it experientially as well as scripturally, and the proof is in the fruit. But every time you spend presence in with the Lord in him. And he, we use the scripture, we are a partaker of the divine nature. 
to partake would be, and this is my favorite illustration, when you partake of a scripture and that reality starts getting written, it's like a painter with a paintbrush painting all the multiple colors. The colors are the attributes and characteristics of Jesus Himself and it's being painted on the inside and hopefully you've got layers and layers and layers of paint so thick that another layer is going to go on top of that. In order for me to put that in practical, as a baby Christian, the Lord wouldn't let me go to Bible school. He was going to take me to the school of the Spirit and I, I'm so glad He did that. But one of the first things he taught me was take name and nature are synonymous, both in the kingdom of God and even the demonic. A demon's name by its nature. Its nature matches its name. Jesus' name matches his nature. I would, he would say, take an attribute of Jesus, any attribute and walk in that attribute until He paints that on the tablet of your heart and you own it at some level. I walked with Him in every name that God has. And I always got a kick out of the one I had trouble with was El Shaddai. God played a joke on me on that one, I think. As I saw Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fishes and there was leftovers. And I was puzzled by the leftovers. Like, I mean, this is my God who is perfect, who can count. And in that moment, whenever there's a little bit of confusion, anything you read in Scripture, there's a little bit of confusion, ask the Holy Spirit in here to teach you. So I said, God, why, why does that bother me? And he revealed the El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough, the all-sufficient one. He's the milk and the meat, and he, he's the Father that his cup overflows. That's not wasteful. That's not not counting. It's extravagant. He's an extravagant lover, that Father. And I'll ah, write that on the tablet of my heart. Put another layer of paint in there on that one. So ever since then, I've seen him as an extravagant, extravagant God. But he taught me to not love foolishly, but love with discernment. To love with discernment means you, you discern where to love. Because the world right now, they love everything. They love sin. They love, they, they love their car. They love their toothpaste. They love everything. And they don't know the difference. But God basically says, I'm going to teach you to love by loving what I love. And your likes and your dislikes have to die. It isn't about your likes and your dislikes. But you're going to learn to love not foolishly either to where you don't know what to do so you just are wasteful. That is not the El Shaddai God. He's a love that abounds in real knowledge, revelation knowledge, internal reality, and all discernment. Discernment is to make a distinction. Didn't I share that last week about the guy that I worked with that was so bad with money? That's a good illustration. God said, don't give him money. He's, his family needs food on their table and he's spending it on stupid ventures. Thought he was an entrepreneur or something. Of, <laughs> thought, and he was doing dumb stuff with money. Don't give it to him. And I didn't give it to him. And he was taking, a, a, he worked in a place where he could take an advance on his register. <laughs> Is my granddaughter just run behind me? <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he stood at this cash register and never got a paycheck because he took an advance. He, kept, he, he just had to take an advance. I, but I just need $5 today. I just need $10 today. And he kept taking that advance. And then finally, one day, God, I'm riding in the car with him, and God says, empty your wallet and give it to him. That violated his instruction to me private, previously to love with discernment. But I knew it was God, and it, you had to die to your preconceived notions. I died to it, emptied my wallet, which wasn't a lot, emptied it, gave it to him, and he burst out crying and had a tremendous spiritual breakthrough. That was the first day in, a, in years that he stared at the open register and decided to trust God instead of take an advance on his paycheck. See, these tests come into your life for you to be a victor. And that God will then acknowledge by the Spirit somehow, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. He will do that. You will learn, but this Spirit in here is trying to teach you. Let him teach you. Don't think you know everything. 
quit going, what would Jesus do? I never liked those bracelets, quite frankly. It will probably offend somebody. But if you've got to think about what Jesus would do, you're back in your head. Why not just go to Jesus? Say, like, Jesus? Oh, wisdom searches out the matter, not figures it out in their head. Now, Revelation number 5. The mystery of divine birth. Did you know there's a difference between being born of God and born again? Born again is that initial salvation experience where you take in the divine seed. But did you recall when Paul was speaking to believers and he says, I pray that Christ be formed in you again? He wants... He wants those that are born of God, under in a level of maturity, born of God refers to really overcomers. When Galatians 4.19 is what I was referring to, my little children for whom I labor and birth again until Messiah Jesus is formed in you. In 1 John, this reality is expressed this way. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. Born of God does not mean that you will never sin. It means habitually you will not be a sinner. You're, we you're wearing the weight of that victory, of that precious seed. You've allowed that seed to grow. You labored in most cases by the things that you suffered and by the death that you died. Entering into deeper levels of the cross, you then enter into a place to where you are expressing that righteousness of God. That's the fifth mystery, that divine birth. But it's, it's a divine birth that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That which is totally immersed and that level of, ma of maturity overcomes the world. Inner reality number six. Basically, it's along those same lines. It's the divine seed. Whoever is born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he has been born of God. You know what it means by he cannot sin. There's not a willfulness there. It's easier to obey than to disobey. That's when you know you've got a handle on something, right? You want internal experiential knowledge. When it's easier for you to obey the word than to disobey it, you've got it. That's the inner assurance. That's the no-so reality from the Spirit. The principle of life is a divine seed that remains permanently and we do not, as a habit, sin. The seventh mystery, that was the divine seed. You have all these down? One, two, three, four, five, six? Seven and last. The mystery of the water, the blood, and the spirit. He who has come by water and blood, Jesus the Messiah, not only by water, but by the water and the blood. And this is... And this is the <clears throat> Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Therefore, there's three that bear witness in heaven. Right? Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. These three. Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth. These three that bear witness on earth is the water, the blood, and the Spirit. How many remember that at the time the water testified. Remember Jesus said, my testimony, I don't testify of myself. But the three that testified. First of all, Matthew 3.16, when he was baptized, Jesus immediately came out of the water. And behold, the heavens opened up to him. And the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove. And a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. A water testified. <coughs> the blood how do we know that the blood testified? You know, when Jesus was on the cross, the soldier came, pierced his side, and out came blood and water. 
Blood and water separated me. He's dead. The blood, the shedding of the blood, the remission of sin was testified by the blood. The third, <clears throat> the Spirit. In John chapter 1, John uh, the Baptist bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. What does this mean for us? Mystery of the water, the blood. How does that apply to us individually? Our baptism in water terminates the old man and it signifies that we are raised in the newness of life. Through the shed blood we're redeemed. The witness of the blood is that life is in the blood. Jesus gave his natural life for the remission of sin. It still amazes me that when Thomas touched him and put his hands in his side and in his hands and the wounds, there was no blood because he's flesh and bones. And he says, I'm not a spirit. Flesh and bones doesn't. But he said, touch me and see. That blood was shed for us. The carnal life is in the blood. The soulish life is in the blood and he gave our soulish life. When he died, we died. His blood was once and for all. This is why it's so nonsense when people try to say there's other ways to God. <laughs> he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I mean, duh, this is not rocket science. It's pretty simple. I came to testify the truth. I am the truth. And for this reason I was born, to testify to this. <laughs> and it was testified by the blood, by the word, and by the spirit. And how does the Spirit testify? How does this apply to us? Regeneration. How many know what I mean by regeneration? That's the new creation you. That means you were born again. That means you are joined to the, your, your spirit mingled with God's spirit and that is the you now. Don't get confused when you're here preaching. When people talk about you, know which you they're talking about and you should be always focusing in on the new creation you, not your, not your independent you that wants to function apart from Jesus. That part we're going to get across, Jennifer, one way or another. We're going to get that, that you is a recreated human spirit. Your real identity. I don't want to hear this nonsense about identity crisis. You have an identity crisis? I'm telling you, the old man died. <laughs> you were raised in newness of life. You should be pursuing that it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. It's a replaced life, and the two are one. And... If I do sin, it's because desires and appetites rose up in me and pulled me out of that union. Drawn away by lusts of the eyes, the flesh, the pride of life, pulled me out of that union to operate independently. It's sin to operate independently. Sin is separation from God. And you separated when you sin, you stepped outside of that relationship and decided to operate independently. But look at this one. Uh, Madame Guyon used to call about the, she had a fancy name for it called the Law of Central Tendency. <laughs> it sounds like gravity to me. But anyway, the Law of Central Tendency. Submit, all right, so you're being pulled. Appetites, flesh, the world of flesh and the devil is pulling at you to come out from that union of him. Instead you go, I sink into him. I submit to God, not try harder. The whole church wants to try harder. It's not in your consecration, it's in your surrender. Yes. Preachers are preaching their consecration. Preach your surrender. Preach a deeper level of the cross. Sink into Him. Every place in your Bible that says put on actually means sink into in order to be clothed. You want the peace to guard your heart and your mind, you go down before it goes up. You don't go up here. You go down to Him and He rises up in peace. You go to peace, peace rules, peace will guard your heart and your mind, and peace of God. I did this in a, in a halfway house with prisoners and basically pull, pulled a knife on me and I felt the peace increase. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? 
He told me, get out of the way or he's going to cut me. And the peace increased. So I got, nah, <laughs> I'm not moving. The God of peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet, but instead you want to protect yourself. Instead of protecting yourself with that flesh wall, you see somebody you don't like or somebody's going to hurt your feelings, you go like this. You know what that's saying? I don't need you, Jesus. I'll take care of this. I'll protect myself with my carnality. And guess what? Anything they say goes right through that wall because it's a carnal wall. It's the devil's door. You think it's a wall. It's the devil's door. You walk in rejection. You've got this canopy. You think, you think you're, oh, I'm safe in here. I'm safe in my little room. That's the devil's room. I prayed this with little kids. Somebody needs to hear this. I prayed this with little kids. Their mom and dad had a knockdown drag out in the living room. So the kid goes and hides in the closet. And demons tell them, you're safe in here. And you put up a fear guard into where you get to grow up in life thinking that fear is going to keep you safe. Well, sure, it's not as bad as the living room where there was a knockdown drag out. But a closet running away is not safe. That was a momentary precaution, but, that's, but the enemy doesn't play fair with kids. He'll teach them that fear keeps you safe. Fear is the devil's doorway. He has access to you from that time on to manipulate and control you. Why do you think God said 365 times, once for every day of the year, fear not? He's telling you, don't do it. I didn't give it to you, don't take it in. A fear guard. Remember the time we ministered to that one person? I saw my, my husband get shot, commit suicide in the backyard. Father, that's right. Father commit suicide in the backyard and saw it with my own eyes. You remember what a trauma that would be? And then to feel that feeling. But you know what? When I went to pray for her, she said, I feel nothing. I've never felt nothing. And you know what I could discern? Fear. But she felt, from her point of view, nothing. And I said, let's receive forgiveness for letting anything guard your heart other than Jesus' love. Will you receive forgiveness for taking in fear knowingly or unknowingly, in her case, unknowingly? She received forgiveness for taking in anything that God wouldn't want her to have. And that thing broke. Boy, she broke down and cried. She felt that. And she not only felt that, and here's the key. She felt the fear she felt the trauma and the grief, but it was momentary. Say that word back to me, momentary. God doesn't have you stay and, and abuse you by remaining in a toxic emotion. But he does say, acknowledge it because that's the work of the cross. Your emotions belong to God. You were bought with the price. Experience it momentarily to be totally set free. Is that a good deal? I'll feel any negative feeling if I can be set free. And he is the only one that can take my pain and my sorrow. She took it and she was just overjoyed. Then you know what she discovered? All this time I never felt what these people are feeling in worship. See, a fear guard was keeping her safe, safe from God. Huh? That was the thing, to, the most noticeable thing. She got a healing on that in a matter of minutes. But what she really enjoyed was the fact that she could feel the presence of God when they worship now. She was outside of that fear guard. Let's pray that somebody needs that because that doesn't fit my little pattern for today. <laughs> Father, right now, if I have any kind of fear, thinking it's keeping me safe, I just bring it to the light right now. I bring it to the light of Jesus in me. And Jesus in me exposes that. I receive forgiveness for knowingly or unknowingly, taking in fear, thinking it was keeping me safe. I welcome that, that light to shine. Illuminate that. Expose the enemy even now. Let your light shine in that darkness right now in my heart. And I receive forgiveness. And now I have the love of God surrounding me like the mountains surround Jerusalem and like a wall of fire surrounds me. I am surrounded by the love of God, a vehement flame of love and passion is guarding my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. 
Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.